Good evening, church. Tonight I want to ask the question, can we ask God for more? So uh, we're going to answer that question. I remember a little while ago being asked to go and see Oliver Twist and just thinking, please, I don't want to go see Oliver Twist. (laughs) And then I went and watched it and I loved it. It was just a great play with great music and great songs and I worked out I actually knew all the songs. And so it was just a a great, a great play and I, I just enjoyed it. But can you ask God for more or should you be satisfied with what you have? Now I'll give you the quick answer. The quick answer is both, right? The answer, of course, is both. When I was working at Woolworths many years ago, I was packing bags, I was getting trolleys, I was filling up shelves and I really wanted to do something for God. I really felt there was something in my life to do something for God and and I wanted to do more. I wanted more from God. I wanted to do something. I was leading a life group at the time, but I felt that there was more. I'd done Bible college and I thought and felt there must be some more. And I remember being really clear. I remember sitting at the, the, or not sitting, that wouldn't be good, standing at the checkout and filling out someone's bags and just thinking like, "I, I want some more, but God, if this is what you have for me the rest of my life, If this is what you want me to do the rest of my life, then I will do it gladly. I think I can do some more. I think there's something more for me. But if this is what you want me to do, then that's what I'll do. And I meant it with all my heart. A few years later, I was a pastor at Paradise Community Church. I was a regional pastor. Now, on that day at Woolworths, when I was asking for more, I wasn't thinking I'd be a pastor one day. I wasn't thinking one day I'd be in ministry. I go, that's way too far for what I could ever go to. That's more than what I could ever believe or ever expect. There's no way I could ever be in full-time ministry. I just wanted to do something more in the church. I just wanted to get more involved. I just wanted more of God. And so all of a sudden, one day, probably seven, eight years later, I'm sitting as a pastor, more than what I ever thought I could do, at, uh, when I was a Woolworths boy, and all of a sudden thinking like, I'm not happy with what God's got for me. I don't like what God's got for me. And I was doing the very thing that I never thought I could do, but I became unhappy. So there needs to be a measure where you are happy to do what God is asking you to do today before he ever opens up the more. Before he ever opens up, there needs to be a a satisfaction in saying, God, you are enough. I believe there's more. I believe there's something else. I believe that God can do something more. But if this is what it is, then I'm happy to be doing that. In the scripture, we find Oliver Twist. His name is Moses. They just kind of worked out the story a little bit differently. See, the desire for more is in all of our hearts. There's something that wants to do more. That we, we all aspire for things. We all have goals. We all have dreams. We all have a longing for significance. And so we see Moses in the Bible. He, he's all of a twist. He wants more. The good thing we see about God, though, is that he's not like the, the kind of overseers of the orphanage who are like, we're going to hang him or we're going to do this or we're going to do that. How dare he ask for more? God is very different, and we're going to have a look at that a little bit later. God is lovingly kind. God is lovingly gracious. So in Exodus 33, Moses is tasked with taking the people that he's looking after into the promised land. God says, I want you to take them into the promised land. But these people aren't nice people. They're just a bunch of complainers. They're just a bunch of whingers, an altogether bad bunch. They're just a, a tough bunch to lead. In fact, Moses, actually, this this would be one of the hardest jobs as a leader ever to do. God tells Moses, I need you to tell them straight to their faces that they're stubborn and that they're rebellious. Imagine today, as a pastor of a merged church, I have to go, you're just stubborn. You're just rebellious. That would not be a great Sunday, right? That that would not be a, a wonderful day. And I hopefully will never need to do that. I generally think pastors that blame the people Ah, there's another story for that. All right, so, so it's not a good day for, for Moses. So he tells them, you're stubborn, you're rebellious. And the people actually listen. And the Bible says they go into mourning 
and they stop wearing jewellery and fine clothes. They actually just give up. They actually just resign. And many times, just condemnation, that's what it does. It actually brings resignation. There can't be any more. I am just hopeless. I am just terrible. They stop wearing jewellery. They stop wearing fine clothes. Basically, they just wear old tracksuit pants and an old T-shirt. Right, And you know someone who goes out wearing an old tree, tracksuit pants and, and an old t-shirt just giving up. Right? Like if, you, if you're going outdoors right, dressed like that, then you've given up. And if you're wearing that tonight, except for you. Right? So, you know, my kids for years thought that's what pyjamas were. Because that's what I always wore when I woke up in the morning. An old pair of tracksuit pants and an old t-shirt. And once I went to the shops, right, in that, I had just given up quickly. Right? And... Uh, and they just thought, your dad, you're going out in your PJs. See, Moses, he actually had a pretty spectacular walk with God up to this point. Exodus 33, 11 says this, Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. How awesome would that be? That he's speaking with God face to face, but who knows that because of the Holy Spirit and because God made a, Jesus made a way into the presence of God, we can speak with God face to face right now. We are friends with God right now. And it's a wonderful thing. But, but Moses wanted more. Moses, he was speaking with God face to face. He was in the tent of meeting. He knew God in a way that, that others didn't, so much so that after being in his presence, he would come and he would have the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God on his face. So one day Moses says to the Lord, Exodus 12, 33, 12, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me, whom you will send with me. I want someone else. You have told me, I know you my name, and I look favorably upon you. So he's, he knows that God knows him. He knows that God looks favorably upon him. He goes, let me know your ways, so that I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. So now he's asked for a little bit more, and God says, yes, I will do it. I will do it. But you see, he asked for more again. The Lord replies, I indeed will do what you ask. I'll look forward to it, and I'll know you my name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. And in brackets, I put, more please, sir. That's what he's asking. Show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass uh, before you and I will call out your name, out in your name, Yahweh, before you. It's interesting, I, and I actually just realized I didn't read this part. It says, I guess, how will anyone know that you look favorably upon me and you people? If you don't go with this, and it says, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the people on the earth. And that's the same with us today. See, it's not going to church that separates you from the people that you work with. It's not your behavior, no matter how good it is, that separates you. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of God that separates you. We need His presence actually more than his purpose. Just going to, to build a big church or, or going to build a big ministry or going to do something great for God is, is actually, I don't want that. I actually want more of God. You know, I, I think about Peter Hooper who this week went to be with the Lord. And I went and saw him in hospital. And he's on essentially his deathbed. And I said, Peter, what would you like me to pray for? And he just said to me, Mark, he goes, I just want the presence of God. He goes, if healing comes in that, awesome. But I just want these last days to be full of the presence of God. And you know the picture that God has left me with Peter Hooper is a picture of him in his hospital bed smiling. He just had this smile on his face, this peace in his heart. He was so kind and gracious and loving to the doctors and the nurses. He knew he was sick. He knew he was most likely going to pass away into God's presence in the, in the next little while. And what was he saying? God, I want your presence. I want your presence. And to be honest, I remember walking out of that 
hospital and just thinking, that's how I want to go. I want to go like that, surrounded by my family that love me, having served God for the whole of my life, but just still saying, I want more of your presence. I want more of your presence. I want more of your presence. See, the presence of God is fantastic. It's such a resource to us, knowing that God is for you. He's called Emmanuel, God with us. That's one of the names of Jesus. And just knowing that God is with you helps you get through anything. It's the best attitude that that you can have. I want to tell you tonight, it's okay to want more of God and more from God. Psalm 130 says, I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. Imagine that soldier. He's out there. Nothing's really happening at night. It's boring. He's probably tried not to fall asleep three times. All these things are going on. And he goes, oh, look at that. Five o'clock in, in Queensland, right? Um, it's, it's dawn's coming, right? It's better to be a century in Queensland, right? But uh, um, at five o'clock, the sun's coming. I can get out of this place. I, I can't wait. I want to have a sleep. I want to have some breakfast. I want to see my wife. I want to see my family. There's this longing. There's this longing. I love the picture that God says, I want more of your presence, God. I want to know more of you, God. I want your presence to go before me, Lord. I want your presence to, to, to distinct me from everyone else. Let it be the presence of God in my life that I want more of. But it actually costs to have more of God. It's not free. To make God your priority is one of the biggest costs you'll ever pay. You know, Jesus makes four, and I use this word on purpose, he makes four terrifying statements. They are written in red. Jesus says these words. Listen to this. He says that anyone who does not hate his mother and father, cannot be my disciple, addressing and dealing with our loyalties in life. He says, anyone who does not bear his cross and seek after me cannot be my disciple, addressing and dealing with a need for sacrifice in the kingdom of God. He says, anyone who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple, addressing and dealing with our obedience to God in our life. He says, anyone who does not deny himself cannot be my disciple, addressing and dealing with the priorities of our life. Jesus is tough when it says, do you want to be my disciple? He deals with your priorities. He deals with your obedience. He deals with sacrifice. He deals with with, with the, the, the issues of your life. And he says, bow down before me. I am not just your Lord. I am not just your Savior. I am also your Lord. See, it's a cost in wanting the things of God. There comes cost with it. You will pay the price somewhere or other because you've got to lay down yourself and seek after God. But it's more than worth it. Think of the story of Peter. Peter is in a bad place. Jesus has just been crucified and he himself, after denying Christ three times, has let Jesus down. All of his thoughts are wondering what is going on. And so he's in his boat because he goes back to what he knows. He's in his boat and he's fishing and he's just depressed. He's just disappointed and he's wondering how did things get like this? He must have been asking himself, was it worth it following Jesus? Was it any point to it? Had he just wasted the last three years kind of like on this thing and all he really got out of it was some just good stories he could tell his mates, right? Like there were some nice stories that happened out of it, but the, the, the goal, the thought, the, the hope that he would have had in following Jesus, he must have gone, what was that all about? It's like God let me down. It's like I've let down Jesus. What is going on? He's depressed. It wasn't worth the cost of following Jesus? Was it worth the cost of of all those years ago when when Jesus did that miracle of the fish and and, and got a a great catch? Was it worth that? And giving up all of his fishing life and all that he knew to follow Jesus like the Bible said that he did. 
And what happens, he's actually even more depressed because he's been fishing all night and he hasn't even caught anything. Right? So he's, it's even worse. So even a thing that he used to do well, it's not even working for him anymore. And he, anyway, and, and, and then like some guy comes at the edge of the water and goes, hey, mate, you caught any fish? Right? Imagine you fished all night and then some joke is, oh, I've caught any fish. I couldn't, oh. Right? And then like, you know, then he's like, why don't you try the other side? He's a fisherman. He's tried every side. Right? Like, it's not like he's only fished his one side. Who's ever gone fishing with someone? You're on the boat. You're fishing. You don't get anything. And someone over the other side catches a fish. You're like, excuse me. Right? And you're like, right? Because that's the side where the fish are. If you're a fisherman, you've tried every side. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to tell you, something happened at that moment. Yeah. He remembered something. He goes, I've heard this before. And he remembered that that's how Jesus called him the first time. And he recognized that Jesus is calling him again. Jesus is calling him out of his disappointment, out of his depression, out of his failure. God is calling him again. But when he calls to him, he comes to him and he asks, Jesus asks him a question. And this is the question. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And right there, he had to make a choice. Am I going to go before where I was really kind of like doing this for public acclaim, which we know by the fact that he would not uh, uh, identify as being one of Jesus' disciples. And Jesus is saying, are you willing to pay the price? Are you going to pay the cost? Are you going to start to put aside what it is that, uh, that men would say and you're actually going to start to follow me? And we see Jesus kind of restore Peter there. He says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my lands, feed my sheep. And we see Peter gratefully and, and mercifully and wonderfully restored. And he does much greater after those times than he ever did before those times. Because anyone can serve God when it's all gone great. When there's miracles around every corner, when things are happening, when, when God is just doing all this stuff. But when you've been to that dark time and you're still going to follow Jesus, are you, when you've gone through that dark night of the soul, are you still going to follow and do what Jesus asked you to do? Yeah. And Peter was forever, was forever serving Jesus after that. Yeah. And tradition says that he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus was and that he was crucified upside down because he's willing to make a stand yeah. for his Saviour. Yeah. See, Jesus said this, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, but it's still a burden and it's still a yoke. The good thing is, is that when we sacrifice, prioritize, and become obedient to Christ, He will give us real riches. He will give us what really matters, and we will live the life that the Bible says is truly life. Yeah. Let me look at this great story in uh, 2 Chronicles 25. And it says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Jehoadin from Jerusalem, and Amaziah did pleasing, did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not wholeheartedly. So he's trying to do the right thing, but he didn't give his whole heart. He's keeping a little bit back. When Amaziah was real established as king, he executed all the officials who had assassinated his father. However, he did not kill the children of the assassins, for he obeyed the command of the Lord, as written by Moses in the book of the law, parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children or children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. Good advice, not really part of the story. Then Amaziah organized the army, assigning generals and captains for all Judah and Benjamin. He took a census and found that he had an army of 300,000 select troops, 20 years or older, all trained in the use of spear and shield. He also paid about 7,500 pounds of silver to hire 100,000 experienced fighting men from Israel. But a man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, do not hire troops from Israel, for the Lord is not with Israel. He will not help those people of Ephraim. If you let them go with your troops in a battle, you will be defeated by the enemy, no matter how well you fight. God will overthrow you, for he has the power to help you or to trip you up. That's great advice there. God can help you or he can trip you up. I know which side I want God to be on for my life. I want him to be helping me. I don't need God to be tripping me up because I'm fairly confident that he's good at it. Right? 
Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about all the silver that I paid to the army of Israel? And the man of God replied, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Whatever you sacrifice for God, God is able to give you more. Whatever you prioritize the kingdom of God and it seemingly cost you something, God is able to give you more. Never think that what you're having to give up to follow the things of God is going to come to your hurt. It will always come to your benefit. God wants to give you more. It's one of the things I love about Christianity. It's the faith of aspiration. It's a faith that says, yes, there's more. We've been doing our life leadership course. And on Thursday night, we, one of the things that we do is people speak for a little while. And one of the topics that they have is, how, why is God good? That's their topic. They've got to speak for seven minutes. And we had three people speak on, uh, on Sunday night. We had Barb Lumsden, a lady who needs a walker to get around. She's had a massive heart attack. And she's got some physical uh, limitations. And she talks about how God is good, even though she's got these physical limitations, that he's got something for her and that there's more than just what her walker and what her condition says it should be. And I'm going, yes, that's good. God wants to give you more. Then we heard Sharice Wills, and she talked about the lessons and the growth that she went through by going through a Job-like experience where it seemed like everything in her life just got turned upside down. All the things that she'd put her faith in just seemed to let her down, but that God taught her through that. And even though it seems like so much was taken away, that there was so much more that came back and was given to her. And then we heard Selena Gergat. She shared of how she came to Christ. And let me tell you, I just wept like a little baby. I just cried and cried and cried and afterwards tried to speak. It was just, it was the gospel. It was the gospel. And she's talked and spoke about how she came to to Christ, how when she came to Christ broken, in despair of life itself, and then how God came and gave her life. Her every day is just the more of God. Her every single day just says, God has more. And that your existence right now, there's more that God can do. Whether there's physical limitations, whether you've gone through a terrible time, or whether you're in a place where you despair of life itself, each one of them had a story of more and it was inspiring to me. That's why I love Christianity. See, Muslims don't have any aspiration for more. It's just Allah's will. Hindus have no expectation of more. It's just karma. Buddhists have no ambition for more. It's just existence is suffering. Each one of these faiths essentially shuts down aspirations, expectations, and ambition. But Jesus said, I come to give life and life more abundant. That's the promise. I come to give you more. There's more than what can happen to you right now. Now, I love this. The word abundant in the Greek is the word parisios. And listen what it means. I love the Greek language because it's such a picture. Exceeding some number, measure, rank, or need. That's the life. God wants to give you more than some number you've got in your head, more than some measure that you think you're worth, more than some rank that you think you could get to, or more than some need that you have right now. He's able to give over and above more than is necessary, super added. I mean, I didn't even know that was an English word, and there it is in the Greek somehow. Super added. I like that word. I'm going to use it more. Super added. I'll have super added parmesan cheese with that. Thanks. (laughs) Exceedingly. (laughs) Exceedingly abundantly. Supremely. What does supremely mean? It's the top. Supremely. Something further. More. Much more than all. More plainly. Superior, extraordinary, surpassing, uncommon. That's my most favorite uh, uh, explanation of the word abundant. Uncommon. I don't want to live a common life. 
I don't want to live nine to five, watch CSI at night, have 2.4 children and a, I don't know, whatever. I just don't want that life. I want to live an uncommon life. And yes, there'll be burdens. Yes, there'll be troubles. Yes, there'll be issues. But I want to live a life that mattered for God and that mattered for the kingdom and that where God has given me more. Preeminent, superiority, advantage, more eminent, more remarkable, more excellent. Yes, God wants us to have more, and yes, you can ask for more. Proverbs 15, 24 says, The way of life winds upward for the wise. It winds upward. Yeah, there's tragedy. Yeah, there's tough times. Yeah, there's things that go on in our life. But the tenor of our life is that we're going upward. The tenor of our life that things are going better for us. Let me show you the very nature of God in creation itself. God makes the Garden of Eden and he puts man in the garden. The Bible says it's got delicious fruit, it's got beautiful trees and and it gives to the eye what is pleasurable. So we see that God in his creation makes something beautiful. The word Eden in the Greek means the word pleasure. So the thing that God does in his creation is is he makes the garden of pleasure. So we actually see the heart of God in that. Like any father, I want my kids to have pleasure. There's nothing like seeing the smile on my kid's face when we give them something that brings them joy, that brings them pleasure. Every parent knows that, and we see the heart of God. Isn't it interesting? The garden of pleasure. That's what it actually says. So God reveals his very nature in creation. He he creates something that gives his children pleasure. Now the Bible says that there are four rivers in the uh, in the Garden of Eden. One is the river Python, one is the river Gihon, one is the river Hidikau, and one is the river Euphrates. Now when you look at the original meanings of those words, Python means increase. Gihon means bursting forth. Hidakel means rapid. Euphrates means fruitfulness. In the very creation, what God created, there were four things where there was more. That God said there was more. And what he's basically saying, there will be a rapid increase of fruitfulness bursting forth out of what God has created. So when we sacrifice or prioritize or put the kingdom of God first, it may cost me something, but when I'm building something of God, there's going to be an app. A rapid increase of fruitfulness bursting forth. It's in the very nature of God. It's how we made things and we see it in creation. Who wants that? An increase bursting forth of rapid fruitfulness. However you put the words of the word, it means that God is going to do something great in your life. Maybe the band could come. See, God wants to give us more. And we can ask. And we can ask. Tonight, we're going to have a time of worship. It's still just very early. And we're going to open up the altar. And I'm going to ask you to ask of God. I'm going to ask you to to ask of God and ask boldly. And God is not like the evil people in the Oliver Twist movie. He wants to give you more. That's who he is. That's the heart. Enough is enough. It's time to ask for more. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. See, asking is essentially a, uh, a posture of humility. It's like saying, I, I can't do it by myself. I, I actually need you, Lord. And that's what happens. And we're going to do that in just a moment. This is, I, I was praying. And this is what I felt. There are people here, you need to ask God for increased influence. Maybe we could all stand because we're going to just sing in just a moment. There's people who who need to ask for a deeper knowledge of Jesus. There are people here that need to ask God for a child to come back to Jesus. There's people here that need to ask for a new sense of call. Not just doing work for Jesus but having an understand that you're called to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
And then I was praying. And there are people here and you need to ask God for your naivety back. And what I mean by that is that there was a time that you just believed. That it was easy just to accept. It was easy just to enter into worship. It was easy just to to kind of allow the Word of God to spring forth and, and, and do something in your life. But I felt that there's a number. And what's happened is that your walk with God essentially has been trampled on and, and talked about. And people who should have known better have, have kind of hurt you. And, and things have happened around you that you, you don't really understand. And, and so when God asks you to have some faith for something, you go like, no, 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 I, I don't really want to dare about that. That's where Peter was. Peter was like, I'm just going to go back fishing. I don't have to have faith to go fishing. I know how to do that. I don't have to believe God anymore about fishing because that's what I know how to do. I, I don't need to trust Him anymore because I'm, I'm a fisherman. I, I don't need to do that. And so you've brought yourself back into a safe place. But just like Peter, it hasn't brought you any fulfillment. It's actually only brought you more and more frustration. And Jesus is at the kind of like the... The, the shore of your life right now and he's saying come 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 and 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 follow me and that you need to start to believe God again you can trust God God is trustworthy you can believe God you can put faith in those things and it's time to as a little child as Jesus said the kingdom is like for the little kids to have an attitude of the kingdom is, is to have an attitude of a child. I just receive. I, I just take it. I, 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 I just take it on board. And so tonight we want us to sing that oceans. Can we sing oceans, please? And I uh, want us to do that. And I'm going to open up the altar. It might be anything. It might be something for work. It might be finance. It might be a relationship. It might be anything. But come on, let's go and ask God for more. Let's come and ask God for more. And let's believe that God is going to give us more. He wants to. It's His heart. And you can ask. Amen. You come now.